does it feel to be a problem? This was the question that W.E.B. Du Bois posed to black Americans in 1903 in his now classic text, The Souls of Black Folk. It had been just a few decades since the end of slavery and reconstruction. And the United States was grappling with the problem of what to do with black Americans who had been freed from slavery, but whose liberation threatened the unity of white Americans in the North and the South. Since then, the question of what to do about black people has dominated discourse in the US. What do we do about black people? About their poverty, their educational achievement gaps, their heightened rates of morbidity and mortality, their voting rights, even their presence in our neighborhoods, schools, and churches. The irony of this question is that it is whiteness and not blackness that is at the heart of racism. There are many forms of racism around the world, but in the United States, racism is about promoting and maintaining white supremacy the belief that white people are inherently superior to all other peoples of the world. And this includes everything about white people, their bodies, their aesthetics, their beliefs, customs, values. White supremacy maintains that white people are uniquely suited for citizenship and self-governance, that they ought to wield dominion and authority over all of creation, and that this is the way that God intends it. The cleverness of white supremacy is that it convinces us that it is the victims of racism who are the problem, when really the problem lies in the hearts, minds, bodies, and souls of the oppressors. Indeed, if anything has become clear since the election of November 2016, it is that America has a problem and its name is whiteness. So, White people, how does it feel to be a problem? Now, you might be uncomfortable by my explicit naming of whiteness and my use of terms by, like white people, it might feel like an insult or an accusation, but that itself is part of the problem. Why is it, after all, that we can use terms like black and Latinx, and indigenous, and Asian American. But when we say white people cringe, why is it that I am comfortable checking off the black box on survey forums, but white people don't like to have their race named out loud? Why is it that I can have a racial identity and white people cannot? That my race is marked, but whiteness is considered normal, neutral, just American. So again, I'll ask, how does it feel to be a problem? I have been navigating white culture for much of my life. And one of the things that I have noticed, indeed anyone can who's been in white spaces, is that white people often react in very culturally prescribed ways, especially when the topic of racism comes up. If you've been in these spaces long enough, you can begin to predict these responses with startling accuracy. Robin D'Angelo called one set of these responses white fragility. It says if there is an invisible force field connecting white people across space and time, directing their responses in ways that they cannot see. In family therapy, we call that a system. And as a black person who's been in that system, who's been living and working and sometimes worshiping in white contexts, I have had to learn how to navigate it in some peculiar ways many people of color do. We often have to code switch to adapt our behavior to fit into white spaces so that white people will think that we fit in so that they'll invite us to the study groups or let us know about the jobs or write us letters of recommendation or hire us. 
We've had to learn the contours of whiteness in order to avoid its sharp edges. We have had to bend and sidestep and sometimes leap to avoid its assault. We have had to armor up, to harden and conceal ourselves to withstand the brunt of its day-to-day -day impact. This is the system that we have to learn to navigate. And it's not just a system, it's a pathological one. In other words, it is a dysfunctional pattern of behavior that white people often feel compelled to act out, even though it might pose a danger to people of other races, even though it might cause them distress. Now, as a clinical psychologist, I have a peculiar relationship to pathology. Other people like to turn away from pathology to pretend it doesn't exist, to repress it, except for when they watch it on reality television. But clinical psychologists, we like to walk right up to pathology and say, you mind if I take a closer look? And so I have taken a closer look at the pathology of whiteness in order to identify its symptoms because every pathology has its symptoms. And these symptoms are kind of the, the, the rules of, of white culture. I'm going to name a few of them today, and I'll say these are not definitive or exhausted, but do me a favor and try them on. See if they are descriptive of your experience of whiteness, whether that is your racial identity or not. The first symptom is conformity. Whiteness is kind of like the old American Express slogan, membership has its privileges. From the colonial period until today, whiteness has been a key marker of fitness for US citizenship. In slavery, your racial identity was the sole determinant of your rights. If you were white, you were free. If you were black, you were enslavable, and if you were indigenous, you were exterminable. The peculiar cruelty of US slavery is that it only took one drop of African blood to make somebody, their default status was bondage. It took freeze papers to prove otherwise. In much the same way that brown people today might have to carry their identity papers on them to prove their documentation or their legal status. New European immigrants to the United States this was the racial contract that they had to take part in. They had to prove themselves on the right side or the white side of this racial contract daily by adhering to white cultural norms. On the one hand, this meant giving up their own racial ethnic identity, their names, their language, their ways of eating and dressing, their holidays, their customs and traditions, and they had to take on the hallmarks of white middle-class propriety, avoiding conflict, valuing emotional restraint, privileging formal education over life experience and having a perceived right to entitlement or comfort. In exchange for their conformity, they got to partake in the privileges and benefits of whiteness, freedom, land ownership, having the right to the access um, to the wages of their labor and the wages of other people's labor, being able to vote and have their vote counted fairly, even the right to be armed and angry in public space. But these were tenuous privileges. People striving for whiteness had to be constantly vigilant of how they were perceived by other people to make sure they were seen as being on the right side of the racial contract because the system punished people who fell on the wrong side. It branded them as race traitors or maybe poor white trash. And so white people learned how to police themselves 
and how to police other people because this is how you keep a system like slavery in place. You teach people to stay in their place to conform. This brings us to the second symptom, trust in authority. Being able to conform to the system was dependent on being able to trust that the system would work in your behalf. And that's what the US systems, the economic, judicial, legislative, even religious systems were designed to do to promote and maintain white dominance in all areas of society. The capital insurrectionists knew this. This was the world that they saw weakening and that they wanted to reinscribe. They felt so assured of their right to do so that they took photos and videos of themselves breaking the law and posted it on social media. See, they didn't think it would matter because they thought the system would do what it would always done, have their back. And it's not just the insurrectionists who think like this. People conditioned into whiteness have been taught that those who wield authority and power will use it in their best interest and that those authority figures will be held accountable if they do not. This is one of the reasons that so many white people, no matter if they consider themselves moderate or sometimes even liberal, they have difficulty condemning acts of police brutality against unarmed black people. Whenever a new video arises, you'll hear things like, well, we don't know what really happened before the camera came on. I mean, surely he must have done something to cause the officer to act that way. Or maybe you'll hear something more like, I know the officer was wrong, but people are too quick to protest. They just need to let the system run its course. You see, believing in the system, trusting in the authority of the system means believing in the myth of meritocracy, the idea that people get what they deserve and earn. So if bad things happen to people like poverty or slavery or getting killed by police, it must be because they've done something bad to deserve it or because they failed to do something good to avoid it. This is how you think when you've been taught to trust in the system. The final symptom is selective sight. Living in a slave-holding society require white people, particularly white Christians, to live in a state of profound cognitive, emotional, and spiritual dissonance. Slavery was a brutal system. It required acts of daily terror and violence to keep it in place. Most white people, ex with the exception of abolitionists, were complicit in this system in some way. They either actively participated in it or they looked the other way and pretended it didn't exist even as they reaped its benefits. Selective sight was what allowed them to deny and repress awareness of the evil that they were surrounded by and in which they participated. It allowed them to think of themselves and their relatives, their neighbors, their racial ethnic skin folk as good, morally upright people, even as they participated in this act of brutal horror. Selective sight is also the reason why so many white Americans, Christian or otherwise, had such a hard time coping with what happened on January 6, 2021 with the Capitol insurrection. Over and over again on the news, on social media, in one-on-one -on -one conversations, we've heard people say it, this is not who we are. But for many black people and other people of color, especially those of us who've paid attention, well, this is who we are. This is who we always been. We've wondered why anybody was surprised. After all the signs were there in full view, there were the takeover of federal lands in Oregon and Nevada, the riots in Charlottesville, the Michigan insurrection and plot to kidnap the governor, even the mobs that had been popping up in places like New York City and DC. These were all dress rehearsals. But when January 6th happened, so many white Americans had trouble 
believing it. They were dumbfounded by it because they were practicing selective sight. And this is what selective sight does. It teaches people to ignore the obvious, especially when the obvious indicts them and their racial ethnic skin folk. So here we are. It's 100 years later since the publication of Du Bois's book and the problem of the 21st century remains the problem of the color line. This time though, it is clearer to us that it is not the problem of blackness, but it is the problem of whiteness because it is becoming more and more obvious that whiteness is a dysfunctional system, that it is a pathology that poses a danger to the well-being of individual white people, definitely to the well-being of black and other people of color, and it poses a threat to the fabric of our democracy if left unchecked. And maybe, for those of us who call ourselves Christians more than that, it poses a threat to the integrity of our witness as people who profess the same faith and claim to be part of the same body and claim to believe that we are all created in the image of God. The good news, though, is that culture can be changed and pathology can be healed. The first step is naming the disease and then identifying its symptoms. And I have given you three to begin working with today, conformity, trust in authority, and selective sight. The next step and your challenge is to begin to determine how each of these is evident in your own life and to begin to practice little acts of dissent against the pathology of whiteness. Because little acts of dissent can and do make a difference. So in conclusion, I'll ask one more time, how does it feel to be a problem? And what are you going to do about it? Thank you.